Praise God. It's so good to see everybody this Resurrection Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. It's such a blessing to celebrate that life together. The life of Christ. Hallelujah. And so I'm thankful for us to be able to make time out of our busy schedules to come on out and to be a part of strengthening, encouraging each other in our faith as we walk with the Lord in this earth. Amen? Amen. It's a wonderful Amen. thing. It's a wonderful thing to know that Jesus is alive. Praise yeah. God. I know some of those things might strike some of us as odd. How can a man that was crucified and hung on a cross be alive? But, you know, the world has it on a calendar. The world, somehow, even when it doesn't want to celebrate that fact, celebrates that fact. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So it isn't today for debate. I'm going to go with the premise that most of us have come into this place because this is what the world ultimately knows it must do. It must acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ come out of the grave on the third day. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And so I'm thankful for that. As we celebrate Christ and his life here, you know, we can reflect on several things. And that's what I would love to do today. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, many of you have Bibles, you can feel free to turn you know, to that page. You can use your phones, your mobile phones and your apps and, and follow along if you like. And, and for those of you that don't, that's fine. You know, we will just make sure that we go slow enough to, to really let the Lord speak his scriptures to our hearts. Amen? And so in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said that I am the way, the truth, in the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So today I'd like to talk about that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Ultimately that means we cannot go to be with our Father without him. He said it. I did it. Amen. So we want to repeat his truths, his words, so that we can all hear and learn. Just because we've moved on, surely there will be a day I will move on. And it will be up to other faithful men to carry the message forward, especially for this local assembly, amen? Yep. As they do in every church. And so we echo those words that he first spoke as they have been spoken to us. And we continue to speak them, that they can continue to be spoken. It is an eternal truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. Until he comes for his church. So he alone, by his sacrifice, his sacrificial living, his life of of walking here in the earth to, as a little child, I, I reflect on little Cammy, you know, and all of our little children. You know, they come in all dressed up, looking wonderful this morning. You know, he started as a little child too in here, and he was a part of the family, and people loved him, and they embraced their time together and did all these things together. Went on family trips and travels together. You know, going on little, you know, family vacations and journeys, and sometimes mom and dad would lose him. Because the one time they left him at the temple, and it wasn't, they didn't think they, they left him, but, you know, they get down the road, and they go, where is he? You know, where's one of our children? Because they had more than one child. And, and they went back to the temple, they retraced their steps, they went back, and they go, oh, what are you doing here? And the Lord, you know, so gracious, you know, even as a little child, 12 years old, you know, well, did you know I need to be about my father's business? You know, he was excited from being a young man to do what the father had called him to do. It was a life that was ready to be poured out to do what Father wanted him to do. And so it was a wonderful thing to watch him grow. He grew in his father's natural father's footsteps, Joseph. He was a carpenter, and he learned carpentry. And he worked. He worked a trade for a while. But there came a day when God called him. There comes a day where God calls every one of us. And he knew something was different that day. He knew now it was not about just doing what I do always, but now my father's voice is speaking to me, and I hear him. I sense what he's saying to me, and I will follow him. And he left that day, never to return to his trade, never to return to his comfort zone. Did that mean that he diminished in his living? Heavens, no, he didn't have a, a place to lay his head. He didn't have a home to call home, a house, you know. But he had a life and a living that was supplied by God's power, his grace. We call that grace. His grace was power within his life to follow the Lord, and he provided God would provide all the time. Even when he was with many, they never went without. He would feed them. He fed thousands. When's the last time we broke some bread and fed thousands with it? I have never did that. <laughs> Man. So he was so willing to, to walk out his father's purpose in the earth. It was such a wonderful thing. And we've seen all the mighty miracles that he's done. They're recorded for you in the scriptures. You may have heard them in, as a child in Sunday school. You may have, you may have you know, learned about his life. But there came a point when that living 
doing Father's purpose was bring, being brought to the conclusion, being brought to the place of finality, finishing the work the Father had given him to do. And those were his words. You know, he prayed in the garden that very last evening before he was taken. And he prayed to the Father very earnestly. He, he was very much concerned that he would find the strength, Father's grace within him, power to do what he had been called to do. And then you know the Bible said that he had sweat even as it were great drops of blood. He was profusely, anxiety was on him. He was nervous. He was, you know, troubled. And he wanted to make sure of one thing. He wanted to make sure of one thing during that anxiety. Father, not my will be done. But your will. I don't want to do this cup. I know it isn't my my desire to, to have to sup from this cup that you've given me. But not my will, Lord. And so the anxiety was not what he had to do. The, the anxiety was that he would not allow his own will to get in the way of what Father called him to do, because that's how he lived his entire life. He lived his entire life sacrificially, raising people from the dead, feeding thousands, healing lame, opening blind eyes. What more could he do to prove who he was? He just would not let men put him up on a pedestal. His kingdom is not of this earth. He was not about to be served as the king here and now because that's not what it was. Man had lost their place with God through the fall. He needed to do something to usher in an era where God's kingdom could indeed come to the earth. And if you know Jesus today, you know what I'm talking about. There was no way for him to bring his kingdom without finishing the work. That is a thought for you to meditate on. There is no way this could have ever happened without him finishing his work. We would have always served him out of obligation, out of duty, out of law. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt do this. I'm always trying to do something to serve the king. God did not come to establish his kingdom that way. God come to usher in a new and living way. Therefore, he is the new way and the truth. And what he did was so powerful that even death, hell, and the grave couldn't hold it. That the, the, the spiritual darkness that's in the earth could not withstand it because they did not know God's plan. And so his work was a perfect work, a perfect work of secrecy, a perfect work that was hidden from even the adversary, the enemy that would come to oppose because no way does the adversary want to see you and I, God's children, be able to bring God's kingdom and live in God's kingdom here in this earth. There's no way because the prince of the power of the air is at ch in charge. And you know that. You watch on your job. You watch any operations of the fall of man and all the wickedness and all the degradation and murder and child abuse and all these things that are going on. And you know that is not God. That's right. Amen. You know that spiritual wickedness running amok amongst humanity that has not come into a place where they can allow God's kingdom to bring the good life, Amen. the abundant life that he promised. Amen. So when he finished his work, he ushered in a way, an entrance into the kingdom of God. And he indeed is the only way. What was that work? That work was just for us today. We're here on Resurrection Sunday, Easter, what we've come to know. Let's clarify it for the teens that when they're asked that question, they go, I'm not sure really what Easter is. Is it about the Easter bunny? Is it about the you know, colored Easter eggs and baskets? You know, what's it all about? No, we know what it's about. Mm -hmm. And we need to teach what it's about. That there was a day when the children of Israel, they were slaves in the land of Egypt. And they were brutally oppressed. And they were beaten down. And they were taken advantage of. And God raised up someone one day that heard his call and said, I'm not willing to go with the flow, Moses. Mm -hmm. He was delivered as a baby, amen. And he was raised up in Pharaoh's palace, but he forsook all the goodness of life that was there for him. You watch Charlton Heston play this on TV, so most of you know the show. And he forsook that good life that he might be obedient to God's call. And one day God called him. And he had to go and, and rise up and be the man that God had called him to be. And yes, he's made mistakes. Moses was not our Savior. He was not perfect. And he made his mistakes, but after four years at the backside of the desert, letting God deal with him and bring him to a place where he could finally be ready to do the things that God called him to do without his will being involved. But simply obedient the Father's will. Father said, tell them. 
This isn't about your strength. This isn't about what you can do. This is about what I'm going to do through you. And Moses learned that lesson in a very painful way on the backside of a desert for 40 years. And he came back, and God was with him and his brother Aaron. And they spoke to the Pharaoh. And after the ten plagues of let my people go, the, the, the Pharaoh finally let him go. But how did he let him go? It was because on that last plague, that last plague that God sent, that he would send a plague amongst all of the living in the land of Egypt, animals included. And it, he would kill the firstborn of every man and woman, every family there, and every beast. He would kill the firstborn. And the way to escape this plague, children of Israel, because I'm here to deliver you, the way to escape this plague is to be able to celebrate the Passover. It is, you will kill yourself a lamb of the first year that's perfect, without blemish, a male lamb. And you will get ready to roast him as by fire. And you will consume this lamb in your house from evening until morning. You shall not depart your home. And you shall take the blood of that animal that's been poured out. And you shall put it on his side. And you will splatter it upon the side posts and the lintel of your door. And when the death angel comes over to smite the firstborn, he will see the blood and he will pass by. And that was called the Feast of the Passover 4,000 years ago. God said in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23, He said, this is the Feast of the Passover you shall celebrate forever. It was never to be done away with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul speaks of that we are to keep the Passover. This is not a law to us. This is a right. This is a feast that God established forever. Why? Because it was fulfilled now in Christ, the perfect Lamb. He lived that sacrificial life. There came a day when the Lamb of God needed to be slain. We no longer kill our little lambs, do we? Because Christ paid one price once and for all. His life was sinless. It was blameless. He was able once and for all to lay down His life and His blood be the atonement upon the mercy seat for God Almighty to say, I can now look past man's sin. Man no longer has to be separate. So Jesus would allow his kingdom to be established without finishing the work. Man could have never approached God because there was sin in our life to prevent us. But Jesus has paid a price whereby sin is removed in the equation. And God can now have relationship with us freely because the price of what I've done wrong, the price of what we've all done wrong has been paid already. He ain't paying it again. It's been paid already, praise God. Amen. Salvation now is a free gift in Christ Jesus. And we're celebrating that today. Because the grave could not hold him. So what he has done is he's ushered in a way for us to enjoy right here, right now, the kingdom of God. Now he can establish his kingdom. When he was being questioned before Pilate, one of the men that was in charge of sentencing him before he went to the cross, he says, you are a king? He says, thou sayest it. Jesus says, thou sayest it. Who was in here to speak of his kingdom? That's right. He went on to say, if, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. But now is. He said, now is my kingdom, not from here. Yeah. But make no mistake, when he hung on that cross, one of the seven last things that he said. Yeah, he said, Father, forgive me, for they know not what they do. But you know what he said? He said, it is finished. It is finished. He had finished the work God had given him to do. And now, now is the kingdom of God. My Bible tells me that when I go and I preach the good news, the gospel of hope, you don't have to be lost no more. That I am to say that the kingdom has come near. Amen? Are you with me in the house today? God told me to say the kingdom has come near. So Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God. So today I'd like to ask us this. What shall we liken the kingdom of God to? That's a good question, a valid question, is it not? What shall we like in the kingdom of God to? If you have your Bibles, however you want to turn to your scriptures, go to Luke chapter 13, and we'll just look at a couple passages here. In Luke chapter 13, verses 18 through 19, Jesus said this, he says, uh, Now what shall I like in the kingdom of God to? What shall I resemble it? First of all, I want, to, I want us to understand what a kingdom is. 
as they get ready to read the rest of that parable. A kingdom is a domain. It's a domain for the king. It's the king's domain. That's why it's kingdom. It's a domain of what? It's a domain of his government. It's where he governs. Isaiah chapter 9 7, don't turn there, we just quoted this the other week. Of the increase of his government, God's government, and his peace, there shall be no end. Amen? There shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom, to order it and to establish it with justice. Justice and judgment from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And only Jesus could do it. Praise the Lord. So in Luke chapter 13, what shall we liken the kingdom of God to? Verse 19 says, It's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took, and he cast into his garden. It grew, and it waxed a great tree. So that the, even the fowls of the air lodged in the branches there of it. The mustard seed is the smallest, smallest seed. And it produces the largest of plants. The kingdom was started on earth. The kingdom of God was started in the smallest of ways. The sacrifice of our Lord. Jesus Christ. But it has grown to be one of the largest unstoppable, unmovable forces that this world has ever come to know. We don't go out and kill and threaten and persecute people into believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is and what He's done for them. We spread the gospel of peace and of love and people everywhere when they recognize how much our Heavenly Father loves them. Turn their hearts to him. And his kingdom continues to increase. And there is no end because our God is love. He loves us so much that he spared not his very best. His only son. And so we're so thankful today that he is the king of kings. The Lord of lords. I got some good scriptures this morning that I was uh, you know, meditating on. And it says that... Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 18, very familiar passage where he's getting ready to write to the churches. John said, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, in the Ephesus, and the Smyrna, and Pergamos, and under the Thyatira, and Sardis, and under Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And he turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were as white like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire, and his feet were like fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp twitched sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell on his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and death. This is not the Christ who is bloody and hanging on the cross that we see much of the church portrayed right. today. Amen. The Christ that lives and reveals himself today to Christians who are willing to leave everything is the Christ that's full of glory. The world can't even comprehend him because he is so majestic, so powerful. He comes and transforms our very lives. I don't serve God because I have to. I serve God because he changed my life. Amen. He made those things that I thought I wanted to do seem as like I never wanted to do those. Only God can do that. No man's law could ever do that for you. God has the power to come in and turn your life around because he created you for a purpose. He created you that others might have hope. Many times we're just lost and without hope for most of our life until the good news hits us square between the eyes. And when I realize that my God loves me, that he's not against me, that he's not here to hold me accountable for all those things I did wrong and believe me, I've done my share. 
that I start to rejoice in the fact that I can trust you, God. If you love me, I'm going to give my heart to you. I'm going to let you come in and fellowship with me. And he changes my being. And I no longer look the same as I did when I first met him. Not to boast. But that's the transforming power of God's work in your life. So many of you know that you've seen brothers and sisters that have walked with Christ and their life is completely flipped upside down. It is completely changed from who they were to who you know them to be. That's the power of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. If I would have known what was entailed in the package when I gave my heart to Jesus, maybe I would have said yes. Maybe I would have said, I don't know, Lord, that's a lie. Yeah. But I know one thing, when he came knocking, when he knocked on the door, I opened. And I never regretted it. Right. And I'm so thankful today to celebrate that resurrection life with you guys. God's promise to us is that none of us have to be left outside of his family. We are no longer the children of wrath, the children of darkness that's in the world, if we accept his gift. If we accept his precious promise. And he has left us his promises. He is not a man that he should lie. If God promised it, he will perform it. Because if he don't, he's a liar. Yeah. I'm here today, I believe they're serving a liar. Oh, Amen. I'm not serving a liar. I know that. I know you're not either. Say, Praise God. God is a, not a man that he should lie. God is able to make good on his promise. And guess what his promise is in Romans chapter 10, verse 13? For all, for whosoever, for everyone, and anyone, doesn't matter if you're Muslim, doesn't matter if you're Buddhist, doesn't matter if you're atheist, or whatever you want to call yourself, it doesn't matter. For all whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't want to receive that promise, I can't make it any better for you, but that's a good promise. All I got to do is call upon the name of the Lord and I shall be saved. The work begins. He finished his work that he might usher in a kingdom. But guess what? When we call upon the name of the Lord, the work begins. His work of coming and fellowshipping in our life to bring us abundant life. And that's exactly a scripture I wanted to quote at some point in here. From John chapter 14, verse 6. That I've come to give life and life more abundant. He comes to bring that living to you that you couldn't have without him. I couldn't find the power to do right when I was... In my own strength, in my own ways, pre-Christ, before I asked him to be my Lord and Savior, I just did what I did best. Woke up and figured out the best way to party and, you know, enjoy my day. <laughs> That's just what it was about. He spared my life several times. One time I woke up in a pool of vomit. You know, some of the people never wake up from a pool of vomit. One time I ran a red light. Thankfully, all the traffic was gone because I was in the middle of it, stoned, couldn't tell what I was doing. I would never have my beautiful children and family. I did stupid stuff. But that's all I could do because that was the life I knew. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, I called upon the name of the Lord. Everything changed. Not overnight. It took maybe a couple weeks. <laughs> it took just a little time. Holy Spirit just come in and illuminate, and you're like, yeah, Lord, yeah, yeah, Lord. Thank God. And it's just been a blessing and a joy to walk with the Lord ever since. So I'm, I'm excited today that we can all come to know the Lord if we just receive the promise. He's not a respecter of persons. He's not here to make good on his promise for just some. He's here to offer to all. And so we're thankful for that. That he is not a man that he should lie. In Revelations, again, there's one more vision I want to give you that John had. In Revelations chapter 19, read a few verses here for you. Chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, and then I'm going to pull some verses 11 through 16 so you can just see the majesty, the glory, the power of our God, who he is, not as the suffering Savior on the cross anymore. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the wife has made herself ready. Who's the wife? Us. 
Uh, we are if we believe on him. Amen? Amen. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right. He said this to John. He said, Right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Jesus is not only the way, but he is the truth. For when he returns, you'll see this. That's what John saw in verse 11 of the same chapter. He saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And his armies, which were in heaven, followed with him upon horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. The sword's the Word of God, cutting asunder. That he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he that treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the truth that we must all reconcile with. He's not only the way that ushered in the kingdom of God for us to have a relationship with him, but he is the truth that every knee shall bow, and every tongue That's shall right. confess. He is King. He is Lord. And we must reconcile with Him. God gave that to Him. Amen. So what then shall we like in the kingdom of God? We looked at it is as a mustard seed. When it has grown great, many find refuge under its branches. And many have also brought their own ways. Am I saying, and is he saying, by any means that the church would forever be pure in the earth? No. There will be those that will find their way in it, that bring their agendas. And so, we've seen many black marks against the church throughout the ages. Does that mean that God is not the Lord of the church? No. no. There is a church that is pure, that is holy, that is true. The Bible refers to it as the little flock. In fact, Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It is my Father's good pleasure to give to you what? The kingdom. So today I'm here to tell you why you're here to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Because it's the Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. If you walk out this door today without having the chance to walk in his kingdom, you're making a choice that's not the best choice. You're free to make that choice. Right? The Lord said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. <laughs> Amen? He says, you either choose life or you choose death. He said, I'm going to give you a good choice. Choose life. <laughs> didn't make us choose it, but he's going to let you choose a good choice here. Choose life. He's excited to give you that abundant life. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> if you look just a little bit further in Luke chapter 13, if you kept your finger there at all, there's another parable preceding, or just following immediately after the parable of that mustard seed. And it's for us bakers, <laughs> for those of us that have did a little, maybe, Baking of bread in our homes with the, the bread making machines. I've done that before. That's cool. I like that. You know, this is a this is a little analogy here, a little parable that will help you understand again what the kingdom of God is like. It is like leaven. What's leaven? Yeast. A little yeast, right? You only take a little bit, right? You don't take much. You know, whatever the recipe calls for, right? <laughs> You, you, you roll it in there, you knead it in there, and you let it do its work. And over time, what happens? It rises. it rises, it grows. And that's exactly what the kingdom of God is like. It was like spiritual leaven. Jesus did something. He just took a little pinch. His work needed to be finished. And what has it produced? You tell me how 2,000 years later, a man that lives over on the other side of the world can sit here, and I will die for Jesus Christ. Amen. How? How can that be? Because that little bit of leaven. It just made the whole lump rise. And I'm a part of knowing him now. Bless God. There is hope. There is hope. It started with his finished work on the cross. And now it's finished with the resurrection. For he is the life. 
I quoted John 10.10 10 for you that he has come to give you abundant life. Today and always we celebrate the life of Jesus Christ. He is alive forevermore. John 14.1 says this. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Everyone believes in a God. Only the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. You know there's a God. He says, therefore, believe also in me. Later on in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says this. He says, peace I leave with you. I give unto you my peace. Not as the world giveth, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's come to give you peace today. There is nothing to fear. My gosh, I don't live a life of fear. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope that is, emanates, right? The joy of the Lord that is our strength just bubbles out of our life. Yeah. People think we're crazy, but I'm not crazy. i got a solemn mind. Amen. <laughs> i got a solemn mind. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. If we just go back a little bit, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I pray the Father, he shall give you another. The comfort. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever. Guess what? He's not there to be a gnawing agitation on your shoulder sitting there saying, you're like the little white angel, the little red devil on your shoulder. He, no! That's not the comforter. The comforter is one that comes in and comforts us in the midst of our living. He comforts our hearts. Amen? Amen. He said, even he, the comforter, is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Who's, who's the world? The world is those that have not said yes to call upon his name. So he come to give us a comforter that he may abide with us forever. And the world cannot receive him because it sees him not. Neither knows him. But for those of us in Christ, we know him. For he dwells in, in us and with us. He shall be in you. Today, I, I understand some of these spiritual truths are not readily understood by those that have not had a chance to call upon the name of the Lord. If you have not been born again, from above, spiritually, if God hasn't done that work in your heart, you can't see. And you can't feel the kingdom. Because it's within us. You can't even live within the kingdom I've spoken of today. But you can if you just believe and call upon his name. Amen. For all who call upon his name shall be saved. Today you are here to say goodbye to the hurt and the pain and the suffering of living life here on this planet, this mortal reality, in your own strength. <coughs> without his joy and grace that resounds in praise and thanksgiving to our Lord Jesus Christ always for us that believe. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, as I get ready to close, says this, verses 45 and 46, he says, and again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, something very precious. Goodly pearls, something very precious. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought it. Yeah, it was worth everything he had. I gladly laid out my life. It's worth everything I have.